Father, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation that I might know you. Lord, open the eyes of my heart that I might know, Lord, the hope to which you have called me. And teach me, O oh God, to walk daily in that hope. For in Jesus' name we pray. Father, now I take authority in the name of Jesus and I bind every deceiving spirit that is there in this place, O oh God. I apply the blood of Jesus over these four corners of this hall and I free this spirit. I free the Holy Spirit to flow here without hindrance. Let ears be open and hearts be touched, O oh God. Let nothing be there in their hearts that stop them from hearing your voice. Let every idol be broken. Cast out the spirit of distraction, of lethargy, of sleep. Let your people hear. Let your people hear. Let your people hear the God. Father the high priest, touch the ears of the priests with blood so that the ears could be sanctified to hear your word. Today I plead the blood of Jesus over the ears of your people. The blood of Jesus, that they may hear your voice, O God. Hear truth, the only truth that can set us free. Thank you, Father. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Are we ready? Hallelujah. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. Remember last Sunday's message? Who has your soul custody? This Sunday, when God alone has your soul custody. Philippians 3.20. Remember, our citizenship is in heaven. From which we also eagerly, that's the Savior. We are waiting for the second coming. So we prepare. Our citizenship is of heaven, not of India. My citizenship is of heaven. I may hold an Indian passport that is not going to take me to heaven. I need another passport. Signed and sealed with the blood of Jesus to go into that place. And I thank God our citizenship is of heaven. So it's talking about there is a kingdom. And there is a kingdom where there is a king. And he calls us to become part of that kingdom. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. What does it say? But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The one who was in charge of the pointer, I want my pointer here. Somebody was entrusted with the pointer last week. Yes. Please remember, when I hold it this way, I am pointing. When I hold it this way, be careful. <laughs> From darkness into his light. This is his kingdom. There are two kingdoms. We were all earlier in this kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. We may have known it, not known it. Doesn't matter. Everyone who doesn't know Jesus, if there is somebody here, please... Don't feel bad. God's word says you are in the kingdom of darkness because you do not know the true light. And then he says there is a kingdom of light. Colossians 2.15 Does Colossians 2.15 says Having disarmed Yeah. Disarmed principalities and powers he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. What is he talking about? It's talking about how there was a clash between those two kingdoms. And the kingdom of light overcame the kingdom of darkness. Jesus overcame the kingdom of darkness. He has disarmed and made them powerless. First you need to realize, is it possible for me to walk in freedom? How is it possible for me to, who made it possible? You need to understand there are two kingdoms and there is a kingdom that's always against us, but he has overcome that kingdom and has made them, made them powerless. Colossians 1.13. Yeah, 1.3. Colossians 
13, 13. 1 and verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of son of his son. Please remember this. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. He has done his part. God has done his part. Jesus has done his part. He has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his son. So you need to realize there are these two kingdoms. Where is this kingdom? There are these two realms. One is called a spiritual kingdom and then there is a physical kingdom which we all see, we experience, we live in that. Angels and demons live in the other realm called the spiritual realm. It's not necessarily above us, it's all around us. We as man, we live in both realms because we are both spirit and body. We need to realize we live in both realms whether we know it or not that realm affects us because we are both spirit and body. And we need to understand from what we see in the scripture and read in the scripture the spiritual realm is superior to the physical realm. Are you getting it? What we do not see is more powerful than what we see and what we do not see is what controls what we see and we need to realize asking what is controlling me? What is controlling me? If that is true, what is controlling me? What I cannot see if it's that's more powerful than what I see? The question we need to ask ourselves is what is controlling me? Demons and angels as I told inhabit that realm but we inhabit both and only by understanding the spiritual and appropriating it can we become overcomers. Our victory comes from understanding the spiritual and the beginning of understanding the spiritual, seeing into the spiritual is the experience in the Bible we call being born again. Remember, go back to that old message about how about being born again. So Jesus tells Nicodemus with all his theological knowledge, he is full of theology, doctrine, everything correct, but he doesn't understand. So Jesus tells that man, unless you are born again, you cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. He will not understand. There are so many people like that around the world. They have been in church for 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years. It's all religion for them. It's all doctrine for them. They have never seen nor entered into the kingdom. They don't understand what is this kingdom? What is this power of the kingdom? Then they see people changing, transformation taking place. They will say, that man came to the Lord only two weeks back. But why is there so much power in his life? Why is that I have been in the church for 50 years and I don't experience that at all? Because scripture says the kingdom of God is a matter of power. It's not a matter of talk. It's not a matter of talk. It's a matter of power. That kingdom is powerful. And we are going to look at certain things today. You need to realize everything the Father has promised you and me, the Heavenly Father, God has promised you is in the spiritual realm. Ephesians 1.3 in the spiritual realm. Only when I understand that spiritual realm, I am able to believe in it, bring it down into my physical realm. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. In Christ. When you are born again, you come in Christ and in the heavenly realm, you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Everything. You meaning? There's nothing more you and I actually need. It's already been given. It's already been deposited in the spiritual realm. If I am not able to get it because I am stuck in the physical realm, I do not know how to break in through there and appropriate it. You get it only by faith. It's only by faith you can enter into the spiritual realm. So scripture says, and we pray accordingly. How do we pray in the beginning before we start any service? Father, open the eyes of my heart that I might see. It's not this eyes. There is the eyes of the spirit. You need to realize the spirit also has eyes. It also has ears. It also has taste. It also has touch. Did you know that? What does scripture say? Taste and see that the Lord is good. 
Taste and see that the Lord is good. What does the Spirit of God say? Six, seven, eight, nine times in the book of Revelation. All those who have ears, let them hear. He knows everybody's got ears, but he knows most will not hear. It's a different hearing altogether. Elisha prays for his servant, open his eyes, suddenly Gehazi sees the chariots of fire surrounding the prophet. The eyes can be opened. You need to realize, okay? The spirit also has, that is, that spiritual senses to be opened. That begins only when you are born again, when you enter into the kingdom. But you need to realize, the kingdom of darkness will always try to keep your eyes on the physical. One of the two the kingdom of darkness will do. Either it will try to keep you focusing on all the physical, the problems, the issues, or fascination, or addiction, whatever it is, or it will lead you into the occult. One of the two. If you delve more into the darkness, this thing, it will lead you into the occult. So the kingdom of darkness either will try to keep you in bondage to the physical or will lead you into the occult. And you need to realize the king, we need to understand the king of this kingdom of darkness. Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. What is he called there by Jesus? What does he say? For even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Whose minds the God of it's not saying God of this world. There's a difference between age and world. Age is talking about the custom, the culture, the attitudes, the fashions, everything. He's the God of that. He's the God of that. He knows how to change things according to the people. What will fascinate each generation? He's the God of that age. Not saying God of the world, the God of that age. And that's why we, do, we don't realize that something new comes up. Suddenly the entire crowd is running after that. The God of the age has pulled them. He's the God of this age. The attitudes, customs, lifestyle, everything. He's the God of that age. One of the first thing he's called in the Bible is the God of this age. Ephesians 2 verses 1 and 2. And he made you alive, believe that, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. There is this air, spiritual atmosphere which is there. He is the prince of it. He says, once you all walked in that, but now he's still working in the sons of disobedience. He still works in, what is that you mean by that? Of this prince of the air. Atmosphere. You go into a house. You must have come very, very cheerful, happy, laughing. Then suddenly you go into a house. And a little later you realize, nobody is smiling there. Everybody seems to be moody and a little later you are also moody. You know why? There is an atmosphere there controlled by your spirit. You go into certain places, certain towns, certain cities, certain villages, certain countries. The atmosphere changes. Controlled by the prince of the power of the air. These are real things. Otherwise every place should be cheerful and free and happy. It doesn't happen. It's the prince. And then, when you get into this, so you are covered by that, overcome by that same prince of the power of the air, where you go, you take that also with you. So certain people, when they enter or come, suddenly there is, things start changing in that room. The people who are laughing are no longer laughing. Suddenly people become moody. Why? Something has come in over there. There is these powers which scripture talks about. But please don't be worried because God has given us greater power. Matthew 12, verse 24 to 28. Another name. Another name. All the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be son of David? But now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Did you see that? And Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself will not stand. 
If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Get that principle very clearly. Because a lot of people go to occult places for deliverance. You never get delivered. They only put a bigger demon in you to keep the smaller one down. Satan cannot cast out Satan. He doesn't do that. You go with one problem, they will deal with that problem. But they don't, you don't realize that problem has been dealt by putting another bigger fellow inside there. And later he will manifest. It's called Bilzebub. The Lord of the Flies. Meaning, demons are like... Like they go around in swarms. Remember last Sunday when we looked at that one man who was demon possessed, how many were there inside him? A legion. Around 5,000 demons were there. Unless you know what authority God has given and how we tackle it, we will not be able to walk in victory because we, you need to, if you want to really fight a battle, win a war, you need to know your enemy also well. You need to know the enemy, his tactics. Revelation 12 verses 7 and 9. What is he called? Is he called? And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. What is he called? You know he's called a dragon. And do you know that in most of Southeast Asia, their favorite image Festivals everywhere celebrated is what they carry around is the dragon. And you know how many centuries those nations were resistant to the gospel. You want to know a secret? Those who are old know it, old in the sense not in age, who have been here for years. The British colonized almost all of Asia, except one small little country, one tiny little country. They took every country. You remember? What the British used to say, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Yes. And what Lincoln said also about that, it's because the good Lord doesn't trust you in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> but you need to realize, they conquered the whole of Asia, except a tiny little country up there in the Himalayas called Bhutan. It was never conquered by the British. You know why? Because the name of the country in its name means Druk Yul, the land of the peaceful dragon. And their founder had made a pact when he came 400 years from Tibet that in return for our land, the enemy said, I will give you peace. That's one, and they're very proud about the fact that they were never colonized. The symbol everywhere is the dragon. That's what he's called, the old dragon. He comes in different forms, different colors, in different places. Revelation 12 verse 10 is given another name. And then I heard a loud voice saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day by night has been cast. And what is he called? He's called the accuser of the brethren. He's called the slanderer, the accuser. So if you accuse a brother, you are joining hands with, with Satan. The believers don't gossip, they don't slander, okay? But his first name, first characteristic is mentioned right in the beginning. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Got it? And the serpent was more cunning. What does it mean? Crafty, subtle, manipulative. That's what it means. He's more cunning than anybody. The enemy is more cunning than any creature you have ever known. So scripture says, you need to understand the enemy, understand his tactics before you can really fight him. Because you are not fighting. Why, why has the, the most powerful army the world has ever known, has the US army failed both in Iraq and in Afghanistan? Because they are fighting an enemy they don't see. All your weapons, all your technology doesn't work unless you see your enemy. And unless you see your enemy and know your enemy, how can you fight them? You need to realize this is an enemy whom we do not see. But he is very, very real. And unless you see him, unless you know him, unless scripture and God and his Holy Spirit opens up how he works, we will never even know that we are in a battle while we are already overcome. So that's why scripture, 1 Corinthians, sorry, Ephesians 6, 6 and verse 12. 6, Ephesians 6 and verse 12. 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Please remember you have a fight with your husband. Don't fight with your husband because we do not fight with our husbands and our wives or friends or bosses. But against principalities, detail is given. Principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly place. Different categories. It's got an order in his kingdom. First thing mentioned is you have principalities. A principality comes from the term prince. Prince, principality. Prince is in charge of a principality. What is under a prince is a principality. So these are the big ones under Satan. Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13. Daniel 10 and verse 13. Daniel is fasting. He is praying. God sends an answer. But what happened? But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Who is saying this? The angel is saying. I was praying, looking for an answer. And I was bringing your answer. And the prince of the kingdom of Persia, the prince over the principality of Persia withstood me. And one of the archangels, one of the chief princes in the angelic order, also there are chief princes. One of the chief princes, Michael had to come to help me for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Are you getting it? Principality, prince, high up in the order. And then we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 6 and 8, rulers of this age. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this, this age who are coming to Nothing. There are rulers of this age, talking about the, the ones under the principalities. Rulers of this age, okay, they, they are the ones who control the culture, the fashions, the systems under which we all get carried away. They are right there behind Indian Idol 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 all. They are there, they take your time away. They get people hooked into things and they finally realize they are not worshipping, they are not praying, they are not following God, they are wasting their time away. By the time you get out of it, 5, 6 years have gone. That's why God says, redeem the time because the days are evil. It's one thing that you never get back. You don't get back your time. You never get back your time. You get carried away because this system is there. These rulers of these ages, they will put pressure on you. They'll make you focus on the things. Don't do, do it. Get up, sit and study, sit and study. Or work hard. You need to make a career. Six years, you don't go to church. You sit days long, day and night, seven days a week. And then finally you finish. You realize there was no need to struggle so hard at all. But by the time you are neither interested in God or His word or His people, they get you, take you away. They take your mind so You need to study the book of Daniel to see that how he studied. Young people, check his book to see how he studied. Then powers. I said, these powers are the ones which operate over specific areas to affect the atmosphere, to control and to manipulate. Ephesians 2.2 2. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. These are the powers that work, like I told you, they control the atmosphere in a house, in an office, in a village. All cities are not the same. If all the cities are the same, why do people all go to Bombay? Why do people live like shoulder to shoulder? In small little 10 by 10 rooms, 10 people, 15 people, 16 people. Why do they live like that? You need to realize there is a power that is operating that is pulling them there. We think they are going there for a life. They had a better life in the villages where they left. Why are people... Why do people go to New Orleans or Sin City or New York? What is pulling them over there? Seasons. Why do they go to... Buenos Aires and all those cities, what is the atmosphere that is over those places? What is pulling them? Do you think everybody in India is applying for a green card just for a degree? You get better degrees over here. It's not that there is something that is pulling you over there. There's something. They will never say that. Even in their application or to their own parents, they will not tell that. But there is something that is pulling them to those places. There is an atmosphere. There is a power that is pulling you. The powers. And then, when the Holy Spirit turns up, you need to realize, when the Holy Spirit, it says, the Holy the Spirit of power, this one demonic, works in the sons of disobedience. 
where the Holy Spirit trains up the sons of God to obedience. While the evil spirits train their sons to disobedience, to rebellion, the Holy Spirit trains his children to obedience. Then you have the rulers that entice people into darkness. But I want to come to the fourth one, spiritual wickedness. The powers of spiritual wickedness which we saw in Ephesians 6. These are the, the large group. There are millions and millions and millions and millions of them. Wherever Jesus went, you do you know demon affected people? Demons. They're called demons. The last one in, you will see there in 6, no, 12, Ephesians 6. There are billions of them. 12. The spiritual host, a word is used over there, spiritual host, what is a large group, swarms of them go around. There are many speculations about where did this group come from? Where did this group come from? Where did this host, these demons come from? Why are the demons after people? Why do the demons oppress people? Why do the demons possess people? Where do these demons come from is the question. Genesis 6 is the first place we try to get an answer. Genesis 6. You will see in verse 2, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And verse 4, they were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children unto them. It says they were giants then and they were giants later. Now do you remember that every culture talks about giants in this world? It's a, it's a combination of an unnatural combination, fallen angels and daughters of men. And out of this race of giants came. And now the question is, can giants do that? Is it possible? Is it possible? Is the question. Genesis chapter 18 verse 8. You remember the three angels, the Lord and the two angels coming to visit Jesus? You remember that? Before the promise for Isaac comes to pass, the three come. These are the two angels and the Lord. What does verse 8 say? So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they... Did you see that? When the angels took human form, they sat there and ate meat, butter, milk. These are things which only the body does. These are things which the body does. So if the if an angel takes a human body and can eat just like us, it can also have a human body and procreate. These are bodily functions. Okay? Bodily functions. That is why he had to destroy that entire race except for one family that had kept pure. That was Noah's family. The entire race had been polluted and he destroys. So in the word used there in Genesis 6 is the actual word Nephilim. They appear again. They appear again. Numbers 13 and verse 33. Numbers 13 and verse 33. Quickly. They saw the giants. The dissonance of Anak came from giants. Do you see that? This is how many hundreds of years later? When the children of Israel, the, the spies go to spy out the, the promised land, they say there were still giants. And what did Genesis 6 say? Later again, there were giants. You will be wondering what we are getting here. I will tell you. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. The Emim had dwelt there in times past, a people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim. The names are different. The names are different. Nephilim means the fallen ones. Anakim means the long-necked ones. Emim means the terrors. Now you do really all those science fiction movies which you have seen where they see saw these human face monsters with long necks and all. You think that is fiction? Hollywood is fully under the control of the enemy. You need to understand. It's fully under the control of the enemy. Okay? They are called under different names in the Bible. Nephilim which means fallen ones. Anakim means the fallen ones which are long named. Emims means the terrors. And you will see another name for them in Deuteronomy 2 verses 19 and 20. 
another set. They also regarded as a land of giants. Giants formerly dwelt there, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumim. The very strange name. You know what it means? The plotters, the deceivers, the plotters. Okay. So you need to realize all these ones were there, millions and millions of them. But there is a problem. They were half human and half spirit. Because they were half human, they know us better than the other demons know. Do you understand what is said about Jesus? That we do not have a high priest who doesn't know us because he was tempted at all points and yet did not sin. Therefore, he understands your and my weakness. Why? He came in the flesh. Are you getting it? These demons know what is the flesh, to live in the flesh is because they have been in the flesh. They are not like the other fallen angels. They know what is to live a life in the flesh. So they know where to tempt us, where to oppress us, where they can bring us down. They know it very well. Please understand this. Okay, so the presumption is the demons, the last category of people mentioned, we're not people, category mentioned in, in that group in Ephesians 6, the demons are not the fallen angels, they are the spirits of the offspring of the demons and the women. Of the fallen angels and the women, those spirits which were killed during the flood and which were later killed, all those spirits are the demons. And these demons are always looking for a human body to inhabit. They want a human body because they were in the body once and they want to live through that body. And they are always called unclean spirits. Luke chapter 11 verse 24 to 26. Now you will get into certain details which Jesus teaches. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. And he says, I will return to my... What does he call the human body? My house. That's my house. From which I came. From which I came. They call the body their home. They like operating in groups. And they will make use of every opportunity that we give them. And Jesus said, they come to steal, to kill and to destroy. You need to understand, they have intelligence. And more than intelligence, they also have experience. Experience of what a human body is. And how do they operate? James 1.14. Okay, you don't have to go there. 1.14 will say that entice. First Timothy 4, 1 and 2 will say they deceive. Romans 8.15 will say they enslave, they entice, they deceive, they enslave. 2 Timothy 1.7 will say they will torment or give you fear in your heart. Luke 8.29 will say they will drive you. Instead of God leading you, they will drive you. Remember the old message, are you led or driven? They will drive you. Titus 1.15 will say they will defile you. They will entice, they will deceive, they will enslave, they will torment, they will drive you and they will defile you. When you are driven, you are no longer in control. Somebody else is pushing you. Okay. And how does this kingdom succeed? How does the kingdom of darkness succeed? It succeeds to two ways. One through deception. Through deception. Second is through our ignorance. What does Jesus say? My people perish because of lack of knowledge because of our ignorance and two they deceive us and Jesus has made that power available to overcome unless you know the basics and you walk in the knowledge of those basics daily in obedience will never overcome because even the good we think can be deception can be deception you need to realize the difference between the old and the new testament Jesus raised the dead did he so did Elisha and Elijah. Jesus did miracles. So did Elijah, Elijah, Elisha, Moses. They all did miracles. Jesus operated power over nature. You know that? So did Moses. But what did Jesus do that Moses, Elijah and Elisha did not do? Luke chapter 11 verse 14 to 23. He's saying something over there. Luke chapter 11 verses 14 to 23. And he was casting out a 
demon and it was mute. So it was. When the demon had gone out, the mute spoke. Did you know that there is a spirit that can call, cause a person to be dumb? If he doesn't speak. Why? Because there is a, I'm not saying all of it is because of demons, but many cases are because of demons. When the demon was cast out, the boy or the man or whoever it was starting to speak. And the multitudes marveled. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Others testing him sought from him a sign from heaven. But he knowing their thoughts said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. If I cast out by demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the, with the finger of God, then the kingdom has come upon you. Then the kingdom has come upon you. What is he talking about? Exodus 31 verse 18. Why is that? Whatever people try to do, the law has gone away, everything has gone away. Whatever people try to do, the Ten Commandments always stand over there. Everybody finally refers to the Ten Commandments. Why? And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave him two tablets of toast, the testimony, tablets of stone written with the... That is the authenticity, this is from me. This is from me. I have written this. This is from me. From the finger of God, that the kingdom. That's how the kingdom first came and approached mankind was when the law, the Ten Commandments were given. This is on which the charter on which the kingdom is based, written by the finger of God. Now Jesus comes and says, I am saying that when I drive out the demons, I am saying this is authentic. This is authentic. This is authentic. And then Exodus 8 and verse 19. When there is a power encounter in the Pharaoh's palace, there is something that happens over there. There is a power encounter there. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. They said there is a limit to which what we can do, we can't go beyond that. This is the finger of God. There is a power encounter there between the power kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And there the pharaohs back off, the, the magicians back off and they say this is the kingdom, the finger of God. So what is God trying to tell us over here? He is saying the kingdom of God is superior to the kingdom of darkness. One, first we need to understand that we never have to be afraid of the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of light is superior to the kingdom of darkness. Two, Jesus is the Lord of heaven and this was his authority. And his authenticity that I am king and I have power over even the powers of darkness. Three, the kingdom of heaven has come to earth. That's why Jesus kept on saying the kingdom of God is here, it is here, it has come to earth. And one day the kingdom of God which is growing in us and growing in one day, it will reach its culmination. What does scripture say? Revelation 11 and verse 15. 11 and verse 15. It says, and one day the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ and he shall reign for ever and ever. Look, that's a day in the future. There is a day in the future where every kingdom shall become the kingdom of Jesus Christ and there will be no powers, no principalities, no rulers over this kingdom. So that's what we are looking forward to. But how do these demons work? Luke chapter 11 verse 21 to 26. 21 to 26. Jesus explains all this. 21 to 26. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me and he who does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes, takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. So he was talking about the demons 
getting into a person. So what is the term that is used? The term that is used is a strong man. If you go to the beginning, you will see a strong man. And the strong man says, this is my house. What is this? Either the body of a man or the mind of a man is the house of the demon. Why does he call it his house? Whether it's a rented house or a bought house, why do we call it our house? We got a document. The document says rental deed or sale deed. Remember, he calls it his house because we gave him a legal right. We have given the enemy a legal right either into our body or into our mind. You need to realize the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of God, both will be there. But God is sovereign. So even in the kingdom of darkness, they cannot do anything unless they have a legal right. And the legal rights are given by us. He may be the first one to come. And then the finger of God comes and he is thrown out. And then we don't take care of what to protect ourselves. What happens? He goes and gets seven others. How does he get in? How does he get in? Ephesians 4 verse 26 and 27. An example is given over there. A small illustration is given over there as how he starts to get in. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place. What is he talking about? The actual word in KGB is do not give the enemy a toehold. Not a foothold, a toehold. Don't give him a foothold. Are you getting it? Do not give him a foothold. So you have to read 5 and uh, 26 and 27 together. God is giving you an example how he begins, how he begins taking over, how he gets his legal right. First thing he says in verse 26 is, yeah, do not let the sun, yeah, be angry. He says, there might be reasons when you lose your temper, be angry, but when you are angry, do not. Be angry, but do not. How do you be angry and not sin? You are angry because of an issue. You sin when you direct accusations against the person. You forget the issue and you start attacking the person. That's how you become angry and then you sin. So God says, okay, you are angry, now you have sinned. Now what do you need to do? Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Before you go to sleep, make peace. Make peace. This isn't a question of pride. It's a question of the enemy getting a toehold into your life. Make peace before the sun goes down on your anger. Make peace immediately. Make peace. If you don't make peace, what happens? The enemy gets a toehold. Why? By tomorrow, you are not even ready to make peace. You have become a little more hardened. It's always easier to say sorry at that point. A little later, one day, two days later, you will realize you have forgotten, but now two days later, you have got angry with another person. Now it's even more difficult to say sorry, because you didn't say sorry the first time. Now the toehold is getting bigger. It's getting bigger. You need to realize the demons cannot do anything as they please. They need legal access. It is even either given by the person or by somebody in authority over them. Are you getting it? So scripture uses one small little example. What is the example over there? You, yeah, It gives an example of, of angry. What about lying? Doesn't it say that? Putting away? Lying. The minute you lie, you are given a toehold. You are given a foothold to the enemy because he is the father of liars. So he says he has lied. So God says, okay, if you want to start attacking him, I take my protection off because he has given you right now. You look into the book of Job, you will see. Book of Job, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. When Satan comes to God and says, and God says, have you seen my man Job? Okay, and Satan answered and said the Lord, does Job fear the Lord for naught? Is it for without any reason that he fears you? What does he say? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house? I can't do anything to him because you have put a hedge around him. Put a hedge around you. God says put a hedge around you. I have put a hedge around you. You don't open up the hedge and give legal right to the enemy, access to the enemy to get in. That's how people allow the enemy to get in. That's why Jesus says when the Holy Spirit comes, he will lead you to the truth and then we have to act on the truth. The minute you have acted on the truth, 
you are free because the demon goes. He leaves. He cannot stand where there is truth. He cannot stand where there is truth. That's how he gets a foothold. Now, I like I told you, there are two ways in which legal access is given. Simple. I sin. The minute I sin, I lie, I, I, lie, I lust, I am angry, whatever, I am opening a doorway for the enemy to come. The other is through a legal access given by me over my children or somebody in authority over me. If somebody has an authority over you, they can open up a door for you. Just imagine this is a classroom and I am teaching and when I am teaching, Gokul is not behaving at all. He is not behaving at all, I get angry and says you will never do well in life. Who am I? A position of authority. Who is he? A student. I have opened a doorway for them to attack him now. Parents say that to children. Husbands say that to wives. Why you still it to children? At every different level there are. But you need to see that you do not give an access. A reason for them to say that. Because scripture says a curse without reason will not work. But if you have given reason, it will work. You got an access. Or just say you are in one of those secret societies called Freemasonry or so many of them are there where you dedicate yourself and your whole household up to these many generations unto those powers. Your child is born and your child has no idea what's going wrong in his or her life. Because you've already been given over by somebody in authority. Access. Access has been given. Access has been given. So you need to be careful to understand without legal access the enemy cannot do anything and legal access is given either by self or somebody who has authority over us. And then there are also two kinds of doorways. One is what we call voluntary, personal sin due to our own choices, behavior or words. The other is involuntary, sins or words of others. Like I said, especially if others have authority over you, like parents, husband, teachers, pastors, and the vows you make to one another. When we were young, say Gokul is 16 year old. Okay, now he's not 16. Okay, he's a father of one, going to be the father of two. Actually, father of two. Okay, but he was 16, and he met a girl who was 14. And they fell in love and he promised, I will never leave you eternity plus one year. <laughs> That's a favorite catch line. Can you imagine what has happened? He's made a wow. And now, by the time he's 17, he's forgotten her. The demons haven't forgotten, they got an access. To do what? To destroy his marriage. They have an access point, legal right given by him, a covenant made with somebody because he said, with you for eternity plus one year. He's 25, he gets married, he and his wife are okay for a little while. After some time things seem not to be working because they are using that legal right to bring in mistrust and distrust and havoc in their marriage. This is how we open up. So this all can be broken in Jesus. The good news is all that can be broken in Jesus. That's the reason. You, you think he punished only for you. God punished on the cross only for our sins. All our stupid things also he got punished so that we could be free. Then this is the generational iniquity. The sins of the ancestors. Jesus said, uh, God said up to the fourth generation. He said he will remember the sins of the ancestors are passed on. That you go back to that old message, sin, iniquity, transgression. You will, you will, you will get it. Please remember, Satan is called right in the beginning, has subtle, cunning and crafty and manipulative. Therefore, what will he do is he will manipulate your circumstances. He will man if he cannot get, let's say he cannot get Gokul to give him a legal access, he will start manipulating his circumstances for a legal access. His work is becoming very difficult. All his employees are giving him trouble. His boss is giving him trouble. His home is giving him trouble. He is frustrated and he says, I wish I was not alive. Got you. I got you there. I'm just waiting for that to come out of your mouth. Got you there. I wish I was dead. I wish I was never born. Do you know the kind of things people say? 
And after some time, why do you see those people have become depressive and suicidal? Because they gave a legal access to the enemy to get in. The enemy can't attack just like that unless we give them legal access. So he will manipulate situations and circumstances. And I will tell you, when is the day, especially if you are a believer and coming to a believing church, when he will start manipulating you most is over the weekend. Because he knows Sunday is coming. And Sunday there is anointing that can set you free. Look back and see, weekends are very bad. Weekends there will be a lot of trouble so that by the time you come here on Sunday, you don't feel like worshipping at all. Yet God says, if you praise and worship, I inhabit myself in the praises of my people. So the enemy will manipulate your weekend, make you tired, weak, fighting, raging, accusing, all kinds of things will happen over the weekend. By the time you come over here on Sunday morning, the worship leader is jumping up and down, people are standing like this, nothing is happening. Are you getting it? But this is how the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the enemy works. And you are wondering what is, what is happening. But you need to realize he is not satisfied with a foothold. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 3 to 5. Because if you do not tackle the enemy at the level of a foothold, if you keep on giving in, what happens? For the weapons of a warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of the foothold will become a stronghold. It's a stronghold when it becomes an addiction. That's why I said September 20, all forms of addiction. All forms of addiction. Anger, you will have secular things offering anger management. Only God who can pull down strongholds. It becomes a stronghold. You remember? God is always trying to help us when the toehold is about to be given. Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Come to Genesis chapter 4 quickly. Got it? Yeah, further down. Yeah, now it is the time for sacrifice, okay? Sacrifice time, Abel and Cain, they brought, well, um, both of them brought their offerings and what does God say? You look at verse 6, verse 6. Okay. And the Lord said unto, okay, now but unto Cain and his offering he did not respect. Now Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. He was very angry. And his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? God saying, Don't give the enemy a foothold. Please don't give the enemy a foothold. And if you do well, shall thou not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. He says, You better rule over sin, or sin will rule over you. Don't give him a foothold. But what did Cain do? Did he deal with that? No. He came there with his brother and when he went into the field, Cain rose against his Abel, his brother and he slew him. Now it has become a stronghold. When you don't deal with anger at the level of a foothold, it will become a stronghold and we will murder. Do we murder? Oh we do. We do murder our brothers and sisters privately with our tongues. We kill them. We kill them. And scripture says, he murdered. Now it has become a stronghold. And come further down. Further down. Now God is coming there to help him to pull down the stronghold. First told him, don't get a foothold. Now help him of this thing. And then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? What did he say? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? I'm not my brother's keeper. I don't know where my brother is. It's not allowing the stronghold to be dealt with. And what does God say? You have given legal access. Now the voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. A little later you will see Cain is going away from the presence of God to be a wanderer for the rest of his life. Why? Because he didn't deal with the stronghold and with the stronghold and there is no hope for him. 
when things are dealt in the beginning at the level of the foothold it is easier when it comes to the level of the stronghold it becomes more difficult more difficult and God in his mercy is always coming to restore us he is saying why are you angry you do right don't look at your brother because he got first rank why are you upset you study well you also will get first rank simple no I am not happy why because you got first rank but you didn't study that's okay even I don't care if I don't get first rank but he shouldn't have got first rank that's the attitude we get more upset because somebody else gets a promotion than the fact that we didn't get a promotion I wish I also got a promotion but why did she get a promotion then we go behind the backs and say that oh, I know how she got a profession she is always cozying up to the manager you already killed your sister we don't do literally what Cain and Abel did but we do it in different ways the same thing is it true? I am talking about real things which we hear all the time oh yeah yeah can't you see how she gets all her promotion she is always there swinging before the Poor thing must have worked so hard, put in extra hours of this thing. They must have evaluated her and all that and gave her a promotion. But you are not willing to accept the fact that you did not work hard. And God said, you have gone the same road you have taken. Why are you upset? If you have done work hard, you don't worry. God says, exaltation comes from me and not from man. Then, the problem is... A demonic stronghold is a fortress made in the mind of lies. It's a fortress. It's very difficult to break down unless you are really serious. See, you think that one deliverance minister will come and he will do like this and he will fall down and get up and go back free only for one day. Second day you are back to the same again. They will only show the ones who are healed on the stage. They never show you two weeks later what their condition is. How many have you seen them? After two days back walking in their healing or walking in their deliverance. How many do you have you seen? It's one thing to see an image on the TV and to actually check out on the facts. The reason we talk about the testimony that we hear is these are people who have consistently walked and studied with the word over weeks and months. And they are manifesting their freedom. It is not seen in an image on the TV. No. We are talking about image on the TV because real freedom doesn't come over somebody swinging your hands over you. It comes when you are willing to deal with every lie and break it down so the strong man cannot live in your mind anymore. He cannot live in your mind anymore. It can be an area of our thoughts where we have made up our minds contrary to God's truth and live according to them. Now they become habits and they become addictions. And you know what's the term that scripture uses? Scripture uses the term imaginations. Pulling down. Remember? In the same place, what does it say? Corinthians. What does it say? 10 verses 3 to 5. 2 Corinthians 10. You need to understand what it means. Hmm? Casting down imaginations. You know what imagination means in the original Greek? It means false logic. It's logic but false. False logic or false reasoning. These imaginations have now made a safe house for the strong man. Getting the picture? Why are you drinking brother? Because I have a very unhappy family life. My wife doesn't care. My parents don't care. My children don't listen. My office is terrible. Therefore I drink to chill for 15 minutes. That's the only relaxation I get. Now, you can't get that person to stop drinking until you break all these lies he has built around it. Because all that is lies. All these are lies, false. You know, logically they will come out. What is that? Everybody chills. Chilling is cool. Drinking is chilling out. So chilling is cool. I'm not a drunkard, I'm just cool. <laughs> Haven't we become cool? It is a big lie. But once we have built this, built this, built this, built this, built this, so what, what is happening? 
Every movie you see, every advertisement you see, a lies told us that unless you want to be macho, unless you want to be really like this, you are not a man or a woman. Because the government has certain structures about the advertisements, so instead of that same liquor bottle, they will use club soda. The one who is watching knows it's not about soda, it is about alcohol. He knows what it is. Where will soda give you that kind of freedom? <laughs> there is no freedom in it in the first place. But when you watch it, you know what he is talking about. And these lies are being sold. So, so if you watch, if you watch this every day of the week, 30 days a month, one year, after some time, you got no problems with any of it because the whole strong house has been built in your mind that this is all alright, this is all okay. You getting it? Now you make a complete ambience. You have created an ambience, right? After that, it is chill, it is cool. Now what do you need? You need soft lights and soft music and a glass of brandy. Ah, how good it is. You've been fooled even more. I'm talking about only one setting. One setting. Only one setting. What about all the other things into which we get trapped into? Why I keep telling you, don't watch movies, don't watch serials. If you all came through that, we know the, the horror of it now that we are believers is that. Can you tell me any movie you watch in Hollywood, Bollywood, Tollywood, where the man and the woman doesn't sleep together before they are married? Where adultery is okay? Where in almost every movie or every family or pair, the man is made to look like a fool and it is a woman who rules the house? Why is this lies being fed? Because it's telling the new generation, generation, it is okay. It is okay to rebel against your parents and wives. It is okay not to submit to your husband. That's the image we are seeing. Every day we are seeing it, seeing it, seeing it, seeing it, seeing it. That's the image we are seeing. And we think it is okay. It is okay. It is okay. And God's word says, it is not okay. It is not okay. There is a truth which I said, it is set for eternity. It doesn't change. And therefore, once we are into that, we will try to avoid the living word. So what will we do? We will still, there is the spirit of religion is there. We need, still need to go to church. So we will go to the church where we are never challenged to change. Where there is no challenge to change. We will go where they will talk about prosperity and health and wealth and brother. We are very happy. Did they talk about changing your lifestyle? No. They never taught, told you about changing your lifestyle. But this is how the enemy builds his stronghold. Are you getting it why scripture is so detailed? Because an ungodly soul tie is not a toehold, it is a stronghold. You have developed a whole set of false logic contrary to the word of God. And now the enemy is sitting there snug. And you are tormented and you have no peace. Well, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace and joy. The peace and joy will not come until righteousness comes. Righteousness will not come until all lies in your mind are replaced by the truth of God. Righteousness doesn't come. This righteousness that comes in the beginning, which Jesus gives to you as a free gift. It's a gift of salvation. But there is another righteousness that will come only when every lie in your mind is being broken and replaced with truth. Are you getting it? Exodus 20 verses 1 to 3. Very interesting verse over there what God is calling. 1 to 3. And God spoke all these words saying, this is where the Ten Commandments are giving. What does he say? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Then you shall have no other gods before me. The problem is we only know from verse 2. When you know only from verse 2, we will become a Pharisee. Thou shall have no other gods before me. God says, no, I don't give you the law before I give you a relationship. I am the Lord who brought you out. Do you know me? Do you know who I am? Before liberty can come to keep the law, he says, a relationship has to come. I am the Lord, God, who brought you. Verse 2. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Do you remember who I am? Do you know from where I took you out? Meaning, if you at any point of time, he says, enjoy Egypt and try to change its nomenclature from the land of bondage, house of bondage into something else, you will never be free. So what did the children of Israel kept on saying, oh, we remember Egypt. How good it was Egypt. We ate freely at the meat pots of Egypt. We had cucumber, leeks, garlic, fish. You know why they were never free? Because they always looked back at the house of bondage and associated pleasure with it. Getting the picture? If you want to break a soul tie which is ungodly, as long as you don't renounce the pleasure you got from it, you will never be free. Even the joy you got in it was false and a lie and demonic. It's not enough to break that soul tie. You have to renounce that pleasure you got from it. Oh, those days, I, I don't drink anymore. Those days, yeah, but it was nice. It was nice. Yeah, before marriage, I had an affair. Yes, I had. Okay, broke up and everything. But those were nice days. God says you are a slave. They were very nice because I said it was based on a lie. It was a lie. Your pain is a lie. Your feeling is a lie. Because everything is a lie. And if you don't call it by what God calls it, you have built a house and the strong man is sitting there happy. You have to call it by its name. David in Psalm 51 stands before God and calls it by name. He says, you know what it is, Lord? It is iniquity. It is transgression. And it's always before you. He didn't say I had a good time with Bathsheba. That's what it is. That's what it is. God doesn't call an affair an affair. He calls an affair adultery. You call it an affair. It's very easy. You have a business affair. Sports. All kind of affairs are there. You just made it one of them. He says, no, I have names for each one of them. Call it by name. And renounce it. Renounce the act. Renounce the pleasure. Renounce the pain. Renounce everything connected with that. Renounce everything connected with Then God says you will be free. He says yes. I still haven't got over it. That's why I saw two weeks back I said if you got anything given by an ex. Throw it away. Don't keep it. If you want your freedom. Because that gives a legal access for the enemy to get into your house. And not only now trouble you, but trouble your children also. The enemy needs legal access. Are you able to hear me at the back? The enemy needs legal access. And legal access is given when we step outside God's word. When we step outside God's word and then come off light with all this lying logic, God says it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. That's the reason why David gets up. The minute he hears the son is dead, the son born of that union, he gets up and he says, let me have my meal. He's not upset with God. He's not angry with God. He says, you are just... What is that? The child at the end of the day was a fruit of an ungodly soul tie. It had to die. And when he responded like that, God sends the prophet to David and says, You what? I will give you another son through that same woman. And he will be king in your place when you die. Because of the way he responded. So please be careful. Everything has to be broken. Everything. Otherwise we move into the dangerous realm of other gods in our life. Psalm 115 verse 4 to 8. The problem of having gods, secret gods in our lives. Does it say? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever He pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk, nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. When it comes to verse 8, it goes beyond that says, if you move into idolatry, he says, I will shut your spiritual eyes, ears, noses, everything. You will not know me. 
will not know me. You will not hear from me. If you got an idol in your heart, if you got a secret idol which you are worshipping, God says, I will shut. You will become just like that. That is when we start rationalizing our sin because we have become like that idol we created. If the idol we created is drunkenness, now we started ra rationalizing drunkenness. If it is sexual immorality, we start rationalizing that. If it is anger, we start rationalizing that. If it is lying, we start rationalizing that. It is okay. Everybody is doing that. He did. She did it. Nobody is looking at the actual fact as to what God said. Why? Because you have become like them. That's what God says. Numbers 25, 3 and Hosea 4, 17. And what happens when you move into that kind of an idolatry? Israel was joined to Baal of Pure, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against. What does that mean? Joined to Baal. Yoked. Soul tied. The soul is tied to the Baal, the false gods. Hosea. Hosea 4.17. You getting it? What does it say? Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him what does Ephraim mean? God has made me fruitful. Fruitful. He says, forget him. He's no longer fruitful. Can have a name called Ephraim, but he's joined to the idols. Let him alone. Leave him alone. Are you getting it? Because our souls get up tied up with people, with ideas, with music, with movies, with associations. And the demons have established strongholds. No pastor, I don't see watch movies. I only watch Kung Fu movies. Nothing else I watch. That's why when you go out, you're always angry because inside the behind this Kung Fu movies is a spirit of rebellion, of war, of fighting. A demonic spirits. Everything that we get into it, behind that there is the spirit of this age, the powers of this age. No, I don't watch Kung Fu at all. I only watch romantic movies. <laughs> so these romantic movie goers are forever falling in love. <laughs> and they are never satisfied with their husband or wife because you are not romantic enough. Always comparison is that in that movie this one did this. You never do that. They don't say it. But they say you never do it. Their always expectation is something from something unrealistic. The demon has got it and making you unsatisfied in a marriage where actually the husband or the wife may be nice, good, kind, whatever, jolly fellow or happy lady. But you are never happy because you pick a picture from somewhere. Since there are a lot of single mom, single pops of all over here in this church and many more will hear by evening. Hundreds of them will hear. Let me tell you about a second marriage. Any of you ever get married a second time? Warning number one. Supposing your marriage broke up. And your marriage broke up because there was infidelity in the marriage. Then you married a second time. The guy is good or the woman is good, whichever way. And then suddenly the guy is on the phone. And you are looking. The demons are telling you. Remember, your first man was always on the phone with another woman. He is doing the same thing. That's how most, you see, marriage failure in the first marriage is 50 plus, marriage failure in the second marriage is 80 plus. Why? Because you have brought all the baggage from your first relationship into the second and the enemy uses all that to mess up the second one. So God married, God got into a marriage relationship with Israel. And Israel messed it up, God gave Israel a bill of divorce and sent off and then he came and preached. And the church came in and Paul is being very strict with the church and saying, be careful you don't bring the mess of the first baggage into the second one. Beware of the Judaizers among you. Beware of them, beware of them because they will bring that mess baggage from the first marriage into the second one and make you into idolaters again. Be careful. Because to freedom you were called. All are practical things which we need to realize. Don't get your images from anywhere other than this. That is the truth that sets you free. 
let me tell you other warning this may be not be I don't know I don't understand India anymore because I live in my small little space with believers alone but I'm telling you when it goes out maybe colleges schools even here abroad beware of drugs drugs sold or consumed along with the unclean spirit comes the spirit of death getting the picture if you have sold drugs this I'm telling to my dear brothers in the prisons in America who will hear tonight you sold drugs, it will take a little time for you to come out of prison because the spirit of death came along with you because you sold death. You got blood on your hands. Unless you renounce, cut and repent for that, not just for selling cocaine, but for selling death, that spirit also has to be broken. You are not going to be free. Everything is, that's what it's, Jesus said. One spirit goes, he comes, it is clean, he'll bring seven others. They walk in groups. They walk in groups. They walk in. With anger always comes the one of murder. One of murder. So be very careful about anger because anger and murder goes very together. The reason you don't murder is only because you don't have the power to murder. If there had been a policeman around that time, Cain wouldn't have killed Abel. There was no policeman around, that's why he killed Many of us don't do the things which you would like to do because we don't have the power. But God judges you anyway for the same crime. Whether you did, that's what he says, he looks into the heart. And second, Matthew chapter 11, 24 to 26. If you are trying for freedom, this is primary. Without this, no man ever gets any freedom. But I say to you, yeah, come, come, uh, Further down? No, no, not 26. What did I say? 11, 24 to 26. Yeah. 11. No, no, not this one. The one where he says, if you do not forgive, your father in heaven also will not forgive. You know that? This is fundamental. Why? Even if there is one person left in the universe whom you haven't for forgiven while living, I will tell you, you could end a pardon. Yeah, anybody found? Matthew 6.15, somebody says, let's see what is that. It's not the Lord's Prayer, okay? Okay. Mark? Mark 11, same numbers? Yeah, Mark 11, try Mark 11, 24. Yes, that is uh, Matthew 6, verse 14. That's enough. Yeah, they're the same thing. Matthew 6, 14. Yeah, yeah, it's coming, it's coming. Don't worry. Since it's such an important passage, we need to. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It's as simple as that. I'm talking about things, if you really want to break soul ties and to walk in freedom, you also need to forgive those trespasses which was connected with that soul tie. A lot of trespasses which was connected with that soul tie. And God says, you don't do it, you don't receive from me. I'm telling you, is that why is this so dangerous is that I don't know if anybody has made it to heaven without the Father forgiving them. don't know whether anyone will ever make it to heaven unless the Father forgives them. And can you imagine holding a grudge against somebody who did something to you 15 years ago keeping you from heaven? Getting it? That's how dangerous it is. How dangerous it is. But the enemy will build this lie around saying, you don't have to do it. You know what she did to me? You know what he did to me? You don't have to forgive it's over there. God says it doesn't work that way. Because what he or she did to you is nothing compared to what you did to me. I am willing to forgive it clean slate. And you are not willing to do that. I keep it. The record is there. You need to be careful. Voluntary footholds which we gave 
to the enemy are removed by confession and turning away a change in behavior. I did, I repent, I change, you restore. God. Voluntary. Involuntary where others were responsible like Freemasonry, vows, oaths and all. Forgive those who have sinned against us. Forgive those. If it was your father, your mother, grandfather, grandmother, water, forgive them and also confess our ungodly response to them. All were said, because of you I have ended like that. God says, confess and ask forgiveness for those. Strongholds, these are two holes. Strongholds are pulled down. Scripture says, pulled down by challenging them and replacing them with the truth and the behavior that aligns with it. Strongholds doesn't come down easily. Don't think that pastor prays at the end of the service or stronghold will come down. It will come down and he will come back again unless you replace it with the truth. That is why we keep on encouraging you to keep studying the word, download, listen, read, print, whatever. Keep on meditating upon the word because as you meditate upon the word, you are replacing a lie in your mind with God's truth. Lie in your mind with God's truth. It has to be replaced. Get this really, really right. Repentance is not an option. Obedience is not an option. Humility is not an option. Humility means believing God's word over and above what you feel. What God says? God says, if our thinking is in line with the enemy, then God is not my father. How many of you think if you sit 30 days in a garage, you will become a car? How many of you think if you sat in a church for 50 years, it makes you a son of God? Nobody by the virtue of sitting in the church, attending religious services has ever become a child of God. You become a child of God when your thoughts and the father's thoughts align. It begins from the time of being born again and then you grow and you start changing your thoughts. So Romans 12 verse 1 and 2, I know it's a little late but it's worth it. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. I was challenged by the other brother and on the other side of, of the globe who said you preached only for one hour 47 week, minutes last week. Why don't you make it two hours today? I will not take them at that offer, but Romans 12 verse 1 and 2. What does it say? Offer your bodies. I beseech you brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies because to sin you need that body. So it says offer that body as a living sacrifice. Remember there are two kinds of sins. One is a sin of commission which you do. Second the sin of omission which are things which you should do which you don't do. Like you know you need to be here on a Wednesday. But you will say I am not going to do it. After all it will be uploaded. When it is uploaded you never listen anyway. You really think you are going to survive? You come to this church and come to church once a week you are really going to survive? When you stand before God, when prisoners stand in queue for the transcript and you sit there in your home and watch TV, you think you will have something to say before God? I'm not kidding, I'm being very serious. You think you have a reason? They have nothing, therefore they value the word of God. God has given us everything and we do not value the word of God. That's why Jesus said the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the thieves, the robbers, they're all entering into the kingdom of God. And we are sitting there and fiddling. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. The serious issues with God. And then, renew. What does the second verse say? Do not be conformed to this world, but by be transformed by the renewing. You know what the actual Greek word renewing of your mind means? It means pulling down the old building and starting from the base again, building up new. This is a power encounter where you pull down all the old structure and build up. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, this one. So the ruler, the prince of this world is somebody else. Don't conform to that pattern, but be transformed by the mind. It has to be pulled on every idea, every thought. Doesn't matter who told you, teacher, father, mother, brother, sister, doesn't matter, pastor. It doesn't align with the word of God, God says throw it out. Remember the old illustration we said, how do they check out whether you are sane or insane? I heard a new one recently. The bathtub is full of water and the doctor asked him, should you empty it with a bucket, a mug 
or a cup which will you use which will you use bucket which will you use bucket which will you use yeah she said pull the plug out <laughs> the others do need a room in their cell it's a bath tub you don't use a bucket you just pull the drain plug off that says use use your mind use your mind it's so just a trick question to wake up some people who are nodding off okay but be transformed by the renewing of your mind your mind has to be renewed or it is not going to work are we ready it's a power encounter jesus says all authority is given to me all power is given to me the word power is the word dynamis from which the word dynamite comes the word authority is the word exousia which means authority to use that power if you give the enemy a legal right in your heart in your mind and then try to use the dynamis power it is not going to work authority power will work only if it is based on that authority if you are stuck to something and says demon of that thing come out the demon laughs at you it will not work i'm telling you it will not work so if you are ready i want the worship team to come to the front i'm just doing a general thing today but i still want you to go back home sit with a piece of paper and the lord will show you things and he will tell you you need to repent you need to forgive you need to renounce there are few things let me tell you in detail one prayer of confession this is a prayer of confession if you have been involved in anything ungodly prayer of repentance for harboring ill will and unforgiveness you have to name those persons when you go back home name those persons third thing forgive yourself you have to forgive yourself and then the demons will leave and then the healing will come and then go back home and start meditating upon this to replace the lie in your minds with the truth of god's word are you getting the procedure you need to pray your confession lord i was involved today you don't have to open your mouth and say it in the presence of your neighbors you can go back home and do it but say lord i was involved in this i was involved in this i was involved in this and i liked it i renounce that i renounce the pleasure and the joy and the pain associated with all that i renounce second i repent the fact that i held unforgiveness in my heart connected with all those soul ties the unforgiveness that was involved second i forgive myself some people don't forgive themselves and it will show in their words i was born for this nothing is ever going to happen for me i am cursed from the day i was born you need to forgive yourself and replace your words with what god says about you that's not what god says that's not what god says you are echoing the words of the enemy who wants to destroy you and then you come to the lord and say lord i am choose to break all ungodly soul ties spirit soul and body every tie are you ready can we stand up as we sing this song this morning father as a church we come to you father and we confess before you lord we have been involved in so many ungodly things to god so many ungodly ties with people with things with associations so many so many ungodly ties oh lord You know each one of them. Nothing is hidden from your sight, O God. And we come to you, Father, and we confess. We confess, O God, and we renounce all the pleasure from that involvement with those things, O God, and all the pain that also has come through that. We believe both are a lie, because what your word says is the truth, and the only truth, O God. Father, I pray, Lord, you will forgive us and set us free. and cleanses for the defilement and the unrighteousness we brought into ourselves oh god father we pray you will forgive us for that ill will and that unforgiveness we harbored in our hearts against the people of oh god you can name them if you want i renounce all unforgiveness against all this people of oh god 
I pray, Father, you will cleanse me with your blood. I chose to forgive them as you have forgiven me. And I chose to bless them as you have blessed me. Father, I also pray, Lord, that I forgive myself. I accept your love and your forgiveness in Jesus' name. Because I believe you took that blame, my blame also upon yourself on the cross. And in Jesus' name, O God, I choose to break every ungodly soul tie, spirit, soul and body, every soul tie to be broken in the name of Jesus, O God. I command in the name of Jesus all parts of others that were bonded to me to return to them. And I command in the name of Jesus all parts of me that are bonded to others and things to return to me. And I take authority in the name of Jesus of Nazareth and I ask every demonic spirit that is oppressing his people to leave now. I command them to leave in Jesus name. We proclaim our body is the temple of the living God, hallowed and sanctified for him and for him alone. That every thought in my mind that is contrary to your word, I pull it down in Jesus name. Every imagination, every feeling, everything that is in my mind that is not According to your word, we cast it down in the name of Jesus. And we confess and we swear that we will replace it with your truth. And we will not leave it empty for the enemy to come back. I take back every legal right given to the enemy in the name of Jesus. I cancel it out in the name of Jesus. And I proclaim that I belong to Jesus and Jesus alone. He alone has right to me because he bought it me with the price of redemption. The blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God that who shed His blood for me, not by silver or by gold. He redeemed me by His blood. So I proclaim today, only He has rights over my life, my entire life. And I pray God that this day forth, You will help me to walk steady in Your ways. To fill my heart and my mind with Your Word. And allow You to order my steps to walk in peace with one another, in my home, in my workplace, in my church, in love and in forgiveness, holding nothing in our hearts, no bitterness, no unforgiveness of God, releasing everybody and everything, and allowing the Spirit of God to come and fill us of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. As we go, we believe what you have said. Your word says, whom the Son has set free, is free indeed. We will not believe what the enemy will try to put in our minds or the feelings he may give. We will believe what your word says and will walk out in freedom of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you. I command every spirit of disease, every spirit of infirmity that came in through those legal rights given to the enemy to leave now in the name of Jesus. I command arthritis to leave in the name of Jesus. I command spondylitis to leave in the name of Jesus. I command every sickness that has come through a spirit of infirmity, cast, cast out those spirits in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. You have to leave the sanctified bodies of his saints. You have to leave these bodies and let bodies be made whole in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. By faith of God, we receive your healing. Your healing for our spirit, our soul, our body. That God, I might serve you with all my soul, all my strength, all my heart of God. All the days of my life. Father, I pray each one of us may serve you, God. Thank you, Father. We also confess what your word says in Thessalonians. That you are well able to keep what we entrust into your hands. Our spirit, our soul and our body till the day of your coming. Thank you, Father. Thank you. We praise you. We worship you, God. We give you the glory and the honor. It belongs to you and to you alone. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us. Amen. Can we sing that song once again? Back home, sit with the Lord. He will show you things from the past. Many, many things He will show you. Just go through that process. Repent, renounce, forgive, cut it off, receive the healing and walk in your freedom. Amen? Amen. And now have good fellowship, better than ever before, because you are free today. <laughs> Hallelujah.